So now we're going to use our closed loop control here to look at how the uh, different transfer functions here affect the stability of our closed loop system. And we're going to do this by looking at the root locus, which I'm introducing. But first, we're just going to set up the problem and talk about what it means. And then in future videos, we'll talk about each individual part and how we actually map the root locus. So first of all, we have this closed loop system. So we're considering the sensor feedback. And so with the transfer function for that, h. And then we have these two, the control. And then we have our plant. Well, usually when we actually apply a control, there's some sort of variable. And we've been calling it k before. It's either been kp if you have proportional control, or you might have ki for integral control, or kd, or really you can call whatever variable you want. But we tend to have some value k that we are changing. And we need to know how we pick that value. So we need to know what value of k will make our system stable. So what we need to do is, usually we've been looking at these two separately, but we're gonna actually kind of smash them all together. And we're going to take out one variable k, that's, that's gonna be the thing that we vary. And then we're, we'll know the plan transfer function and if our control has a contribution, like a one over s for integral control or an s from derivative control then we're going to move that all into one function. So what we're going to do is essentially change gc, gp multiplied together into k. And we're going to call this a general g with no subscript. So try not to get confused. But we're going to move it into this form because we're going to start varying k. So this is our independent variable. It's a scalar. And then we're going to lump all of the transfer function terms into this g. So what that means here is that instead of having them as independent blocks, the controller and the plant, we're going to have one, we'll call it a gain. So we'll call it k here. This is our control variable, scalar. And then we just have one general g, g of s, that is everything else lumped together. And what we're trying to look at is how we, so if Valerie is the designer, how she can change k, this value, in order to make this closed loop stable. And you know, if she picks a very high value of k, what will the, the poles of the system look like if she takes a very low value? So we'll actually be able to map that out on the s-plane. Now that we've adapted our feedback loop with k and g, we now need to update our closed loop transfer function. So we can do that by replacing these values. So our, our new closed loop transfer function would be equal to now just kg in the numerator, so k times g of s. And then 1 plus, now we're replacing the, the gp, gc with k, g of s again, and h of s. Okay, so this is our closed loop transfer function for this representation. Now to look at the stability of the system, we need to look at the poles. So we just look at the denominator here. So our poles, if you remember, are the values of s that make this expression zero. So we can also write that as one plus k times g of s, h of s, is equal to zero. Okay, so, and as we change k, we will observe that our expression will change. Our poles will move around because it's a, it's a variable that's affecting their position. So we can also rewrite this, though, if we want to kind of focus on this part. This expression, so k, g of s, h of s, for this to be satisfied has to be equal to negative one. And again, we'll be picking s values. And so s on the s plane, it's the same as the real and the imaginary aspects. And we can also write s values as, we can either write, so say you have a point here, you can write that as you know, some x value and y, some y value times j, your imaginary component. 
You can also write it as a magnitude. It's like a vector. So you have some magnitude and you have some angle here. So I'll call it m and theta, sure. So you can also write it in that way. And the angle is relative to the positive part of the real axis. So this would be 0, and you can rotate around it. So if you think about what negative 1 is on the s-plane, so negative 1 is a point over here, right? So negative 1, it's on the real axis. So its magnitude is just simply going to be 1. So magnitude is just 1. So we have kind of break this down. So the magnitude of this thing, k g of s, h of s, has to be equal to 1. And if we look at the angle, the angle here relative to the real axis, the positive real axis, is exactly 1, 180. So you can do positive 180 or negative 180. Um, but it's going to be pointing to the left. So we'll just call that 180 degrees. So the angle of this whole expression here g of s, h of s, has to be equal to 180. Okay. So one other thing I'll add is that this k value, we're actually going to choose to look at k from positive, a positive values of k only. So k will be defined as greater than or equal to 0. Once we know that, we can actually take this k out of here so we can take the k out and actually divide by this expression. So we can look at k equal to 1 over the absolute value of g of s, h of s, and kind of break it down further. And here, since k is just a scalar, you can take it out of the um, angle here. And you know that the remaining part has to be 180. So the angle of g of s, h of s, has to equal to 180 in order to satisfy the pole conditions. So this is a setup for the root locus. And so we're going to break it down into, again, the magnitude has to be 1 for this whole thing. And the angle also has to be 180. Since we decide that we constrain k to be positive values, and of course it's a scalar, so um, we can also make these conclusions about our system. So this will help us find the poles. And in the next one, we'll look at how to actually draw the root locus, the movement of the poles as k changes on the s-plane.